Look at the wrist, look at the wrist. <laughs> All right, then. Hunty, let's do this. My name is Biala Akani. I'm currently residing in Seattle, Washington. My family background is Nigerian, and I was born in Atlanta, Georgia. Came to Seattle around the time I was 11 years old. <clears throat> um, it's so funny because when Leah and Elysia first invited me to do this project, you know, I read the poem by Asan Shakur, um, and I didn't feel like I identified it with it any longer. And as we've gone through this process, like this month-long process of deep introspection, like I see that there's so many areas where I'm still, where I still identify with that poem. And it's, it very much speaks of parts of my life right now, or parts where I'm still conflicted, conflicted and oppressed and constricted. And it's been really eye-opening to go through this process and you know, see that and witness that and do the work to see more about what's going on in my mind and my body. Because um, I think it's so easy to bury things, you know, to just bury them and say that, you know, I've done the healing there, I've done the work, and just close that box. And since doing this, pro this process with them and with Jess as well, 
being a being a black woman is hard. Being a black woman is just really difficult. We're very we're we're an underrepresented group, marginalized group, um, low on the totem pole, and the word that comes to my mind that I'm finding that I've been really dealing with and trying to shove away and shove down is worthiness. <clears throat> You know, when I was younger growing up, I never felt worthy. I never felt special. You know, I was kind of like the oddball in my family. I never felt like being me was okay. And I felt like there was always something wrong with me from a young age, whether it be being made fun of because of the way I looked, being too dark skinned because of my frown, because I was so unhappy, um, because I was kind of a tomboy. Um, being misunderstood, being called ugly, you know, all these things. I just was, I just felt so worthless when I was young. From a very young age, I felt really worthless. And I didn't know where I would fit in. And I just grew up with that mentality of worthlessness. I just didn't see anything special. And when we moved here to Washington State, it just got worse. I had severe, severe, severe anxiety. Um, Every day I went to school because I was constantly being made fun of, constantly being ostracized um, and alienated. Even, you know, the friends that I did have, you know, people would go out of their way to say something negative about me. And it just made it so that people just didn't want to be around me. They didn't want to be around me because of what I represented. And it made me feel really small and really unworthy, going back to that unworthiness and... I remember some of my prayers would just be like, just let me have a good day. That would be the prayers I would have like in middle school. Let me have a good day. And once again, like no one really knew. And then I was suffering from, you know, different type of abuse that I suffered when I was younger. Um, you know, bullying and then sexual abuse. And so all of this cloud, all of this heaviness came on at a very young age. And what I'm saying and what I'm noticing is that a lot of black women deal with that. At a very young age, it's this marginalization, this, this smallness, whether it be internally or externally, but it's things that kind of pile up and then you just grow up with it. And then there's this sense of self-worth is completely obliterated. And you know, it just made sense for me to run to drugs. It just seemed like the biggest escape. I struggled with drug abuse in college. At the same time, I was dealing with this idea of, you know, trying to fit in, trying to get people to like me. So there was this idea of me going on the spectrum of being hypersexualized. You know, the hypersexualized black woman. I would watch that. At the same time, on the other side of the spectrum, there was this competing notion that I learned from my mom as to really trying to be as conservative as possible as a black woman so that you wouldn't get that hypersexualization stigma. So I knew that, you know, going on that side of the spectrum would have a negative impact. At the same time, the conservative side of the spectrum felt so empty and it didn't feel like me and it felt like I was being a robot. But once again, I was denying myself either way. And so when I went through the other side of the spectrum, hypersexualization, it just further increased my depression because I was looking for, you know, looking for answers from other people, you know. I was trying to hype myself up, whether it be through makeup, you know, tight clothes or whatnot, just to get attention. And it got me attention, the negative attention that I didn't want, which eventually led me to shroud myself. And I swung on the other side of the pendulum and it was during college that I just stopped wearing anything, any makeup or anything. I just wore baggy clothes and swam in everything. And I never smiled. I still rarely could remember myself smiling in high school or in college. And, you know, my mom would like make fun of me. She would call me like a hobo, you know, because that's like, I literally would just go to any type of thrift store, the biggest pieces of clothing that I could find that I could swim in, that I could hide my curves, that I would hide anything that would be suggestive to a man, I would hide. I had been living 
24 years as a dead human being. I was like a walking zombie. Nothing really impacted me, nothing brought me joy. I didn't know joy. I barely knew happiness. All I knew was anxiety, depression, and worthlessness, and smallness. And then my senior year, my roommate suggested I try yoga. And it was just completely physical at the beginning, and it became something completely different. Yoga gave me the ability to see myself clearly, to see the truth and the beliefs that I had about myself, but to also see the beauty of myself and to start to acknowledge the beauty about myself, to start to acknowledge my own worth and to build my worth by myself, not from another person person or human being, to build it by myself, and that was so empowering, and it just continued to grow me from the inside out, and I started to become alive, I think from the time I was born to 24, I was literally dead, 25, I started to awaken and become alive to life. I started to actually smile. I smiled. And I laughed and I felt it in my gut and my belly. And I was actually happy inside. I was just, I wasn't just pretending happiness. I was actually, actually really happy and I wasn't worried about hypersexualization or too much masculinity now is finally becoming aware of just my divine the divine in me the centered balanced me I wasn't too much of anything or too little of anything and I started to pull away the masks and the belief systems that I had adopted as my reality and I started to become Biala I started to become myself. And it's so phenomenal. Black women, women of color, have so much power and so much strength. And the beatdown is strategic because of the strength and the power that we have. All of reality is mimicking everything we're doing because of our beauty, because of our power, and because of our strength. And I know that you hear people talk about this, but you don't really, might not believe it, but I'm telling you, it's so true. The beauty and the power that you have inside of yourself is so rare. And it's so unique. And it is so special. It's something that you should allow everyone to see. Because eventually what I've come to find is that me hiding myself is not only doing me a disservice, it's doing you a disservice. I owe it to myself and I owe it to you to show who I am, to build myself up, to begin to allow myself to be healed, to receive healing, so that I can be strong and so that I can show you your strength, your power, your glory, your might, because it's, it's very real. It's not make-believe. It's real. And I'm living proof that it's real.
whenever you're ready. <laughs> Obviously not yet. <laughs> My name is Jessica and I'm originally from Seattle and have been in Seattle for the last four years, four or five years. Before that I went to school in San Francisco and lived in New York so I got to spend some time on the West Coast and the East Coast and really learn to appreciate what the Northwest has to offer. And in that appreciation I was able to come back to my roots and come back to my sensitivity. There's so much vibrant life here in the forest and just the water and the mountains and the seasons and really helped me to get in touch with myself, which is kind of where we're headed with this whole thing. Um, from a very young age, I was often told how sensitive I was and that I was too sensitive and why are you crying and why are you so upset and I just felt things so deeply always have and that depth of emotion for any living thing sounds silly to say trees um, but I felt it people I felt it and in being told that you're too sensitive and that it's not safe to be so, I started to shut down those areas of my sensitivity and began to fit into the molds that I could see. So I started to create this structure around myself to protect myself, but more to fit in um, because that sensitivity and that love also is in connection. And so I wanted to be in connection and so I created these structures and was able to eventually fit myself into structures. I, you know, played college soccer and was a finance major, got my master's in business, moved to New York City, which is where the New York Park comes in, and that's a very structured place. And I was living there and working there and feeling that all of these moving parts of what I thought I was supposed to be and wanted were very empty. I don't have to live like this. And I was like, what am I doing here? I don't have to live like this. I am freezing, like near death. <laughs> Like every time I go outside, it's legitimately life or death. You forget your gloves and your fingertips are going to be so sorry. <laughs> so sorry. And there's so many people that are just struggling and not, you know, not, not okay, not in the right space. And, and every day you have to walk by and you can't do anything. And it just slowly takes a toll, takes a toll, takes a toll. So, and then you start to, there's so many people that people become things too. And so now you just deal. And I remember I was walking and this, and I was, you know, just naturally smiling. He's like, you can't do that. And I was like, what? He's like, you don't just smile at people here. Like that will get you into trouble. And I was like, wow, really? Okay. So I guess New York was where I went to the depth of you can't even smile at another person that you don't know because that's dangerous and that, that is such a suppression of sensitivity. And in the void I found that I couldn't live like that. I guess you come to a place where you either decide am I gonna exist in the mold that I created for myself, or am I actually going to live? And I made the choice, and I quit the jobs I had, and I moved back to Seattle, and I really started to do some spiritual work, some search in, not some, a lot, continual, ongoing, still currently searching. <laughs> 
but I have more direction and focus. I have direction and focus. I love working with people and I love that connection. And in teaching yoga, I learned that it matters. It might not be the most um, respected thing by all people, but it's something that helps people and changes people. I started to te like teach meditations and do um, childbirth classes in accessing my sensitivity. I continually get gifts now from, <laughs> from Mother Earth. I have been blessed to be at the births of children because people want my presence there, which is life-changing. And for me, being as sensitive as I am to be invited into sacred space where being is entering is, is profound. And I wouldn't have ever been given the privilege had I stayed in the mold and in the box because I wouldn't have ever built those relationships and those connections in a way where someone felt comfortable enough to ask that of me. And so now that I have this new focus in harnessing my sensitivity and using it to help and to share and to give, it feels not only like a gift, uh, but an asset and something that is going to continue to propel me forward in a positive way. Appreciating my sensitivity and learning to accept it and embrace it and starting to actually work with it, I started to have this, now my life feels like this incredible journey. I, from being gifted, being in the, you know, the room, uh, the birthing room and deciding that actually what I needed to do was become trained as a doula. And I started the doula training, which led me to working in an organization that serves uh, minority women who um, don't necessarily have access to doulas, but um, could absolutely use the birth support. And now I'm serving in a way that feels so good for my spirit and my soul and have been just doing art and watercolors and chalk and getting to express myself and in that expression having people share that their appreciation which isn't why I'm accessing the sensitivity, but helps me understand that it's valuable and that it does help shift what's going on in the world. So much uh, of the messages are about negativity and the structures and control. And I'm learning that really when you access those places of sensitivity and are able to share it, whether it's creatively through physical expression or artistically or just in the care and attention that you give to another person that that matters in a way that nothing else can do. We're living like breathing energetic means and our purpose is in the connection and enjoyment of each other and of Mother Earth, the planet and that connection is through the sensitivity. And so not only does it matter, but it's, it's vital to, to our joy and happiness and all the things that make it wonderful to be a human being. <laughs>
And you can just look up and smile. Hello world. <laughs> uh, my name's Elicia, um, aka Starbird, aka Daughter of the Universe, aka Brown Sugar. Just kidding. <laughs> Um, and I am originally from North Carolina, from the 919. Um, I have lived in North Carolina, well, lived in North Carolina pretty much all of my life, um, and then moved to the Seattle area about three years ago with Glory Child. <laughs> um, and growing up for me, everything was about church and God. I was raised in a really conservative Christian family, but I would say conservative in terms of like definitely trying to raise us with what they considered the right values, the right morals. I was raised by my dad, but we lived in a house with my grandma, my aunt, my sister, my cousin, and my dad, and it was a two-bedroom, so it was like really close, really tight-knit family unit, and God was at the center of everything. Church was not only like a Sunday requirement, it was Sunday school, then service, then Wednesday Bible study, and vacation Bible school every summer. Um, not only did we celebrate God in the sanctuary, but God was in the center of our home all the time. Before we would go to school in the mornings when I was in elementary school, we would have devotion every single morning. And we would have uh, different tasks that each of us would have uh, depending on what day it was. Somebody was in charge of the music, so we had these instruments that nobody knew how to play. but. Somebody had to play the, the instruments because we had to have praise and devotion, uh, praise and worship, I mean. And somebody would recite the books of the Bible. So in church, I was that person who always knew where the pastor was going and didn't have to ask my neighbor because that was a skill that we learned growing up. Um, somebody read scripture, somebody prayed, and all of this before you stepped on the school bus. And that was every single day. And I remember that God was very personal for me. Everything that I did, every, everywhere that I went, I felt God with me. I prayed a lot. When I was young, our pastor, the late Bishop El Fode Farah, uh, anointed my head with oil and said that I would be a great intercessor, just like my grandmother. And I mean, I think I was like eight at the time, so I have no idea what he's talking about. But I remember that moment really, really clearly that this connection that my grandma had to God and whatever it was that she did on God's behalf or that God called for her to do, that I was being called to do the same thing. And to me, that was really cool. That was an honor. Um, and I started to learn a little bit more about what that meant. But I, I, I was always praying, you know, and, and not even just like a formal prayer though. I would be playing outside and talking to God and we were cool. We were, we had a connection. We, I knew God, God knew me. And there was, there was no doubt in my mind that that was true. But I remember church sometimes being a dark place as well. I knew from a very young age that my sexual orientation was not the norm, you know, that it was something that I needed to keep quiet and to myself and change, not just hide, but it was not acceptable. And I could, I learned that in church from seeing how other people were treated and how other people were talked about and the lessons that we learned. So a lot of times I felt this disconnection with the church itself but I always still felt like, at least when I was young, I still felt like God and I were close. And then the older I got and the more I realized that 
my sexuality wasn't a phase and it wasn't going anywhere. And apparently nobody's opinions were ever going to change about the Bible because it wasn't a thing. Being Baptist is not a thing that evolves. It's, it's not an evolving spirituality. It is, this is the law, this is the code, and it is what it is. So I really resented that. I resented the idea that my God, who I knew very, very well, didn't like me or didn't approve of me because of something that was completely beyond my control. I can, de- I can decide who I date. I can decide who I want to be with. I can't decide who I feel attracted to. I can't decide where I feel drawn. And the fact that my God, that, that he didn't want me, that I was going to hell because of that, It crushed me. It destroyed me. Inside, I would appear very friendly, very happy-go-lucky, and on the inside, I was tortured. That's how I felt. And I definitely suffered from depression and really did everything I could to distance myself from the church because in my mind, the church and God and these belief systems were all connected together and if they didn't want me I didn't want them as soon as I went to college I did what I wanted to do I surrounded myself with the people I wanted to people who loved and accepted me for who I was and a lot of these people were feeling the same way that I was feeling like forget the church They don't want us, you know, we don't belong there. We belong there as long as we can make ourselves look and act like everybody else, but we don't belong there as who we are. And I really, that resonated with me. And I can't say for sure when I stopped drinking because I wanted to party and when I started drinking because I wanted to bury. I wanted to bury those feelings deep inside me. First of all, I wanted to be normal and straight. I wanted to be the person that my family wanted me to be. I didn't want my sexuality to be this thing that divided us and I still hadn't really talked to them about how I was feeling. So I felt like maybe I can, maybe I can. Maybe I can force myself into something else. Maybe, maybe everybody's right, maybe it is a choice. That didn't work out very well for me. And the more I realized that I couldn't, the more I turned to alcohol. Because it let me forget for a little bit. It it let me believe in my mind that that wasn't my reality. That it, I felt like it was gonna take away the hurt and the pain because I was gonna be able to be light and free and you know, just having a good time. Like, you know, when I drank when I was 18 or 19 or, or excuse me, 21 or 22. <laughs> um, but it didn't. When you have dark things inside of you, alcohol only makes them darker. It only, you bury them, but they're still there. And now they're tangled in this complicated web of other emotions that you've suppressed, that you've hidden. And that was freaking hard. It was really hard. Because now here was another thing that I was having to hide, that I was having to deal with on my own, without any help from my God, who I still felt like didn't want me. I, I started learning about this connection between nature and spirituality. Stopped drinking because I just couldn't keep going on and I didn't have any reason to hide anymore. I didn't have any reason to hold hold myself back anymore and I needed to move forward. I I needed a fresh start and when I stopped drinking I found yoga and yoga reinforced that connection to nature and this aspect of spirituality being something different but congruent to religion. Um, 
And just that word spirit, like when we think about the Holy Spirit, nobody ever really tells you like what that means or, or what that's supposed to look like or feel like or and starting to to experience spirituality for myself, feeling the spirit inside of me, this this essence of God that had been tainted. So I didn't even know what it was, but I realized, you know, I went back to to my childhood innocence when God was mine and I had all these ideas of God and I knew for a fact that God God was mine, that God walked with me and I I started to to merge all of those ideas together subconsciously. I found myself breathing differently and moving differently and coming from a different place, finding this appreciation for this rawness. When you're not drinking, you're not taking something that alters your state of mind, there's this rawness to life. It's overwhelming at first because you're used to numbing everything. And even through my teenage years, I was used to numbing, you know, to hiding, to holding, to burying, to suppressing. And when you don't do that anymore, everything is new and different. And I, I felt spirit, I felt God in everything. And I felt much more connected to my God. I started to feel God again. I started to realize that God was with me all along and God isn't, I don't need anybody to tell me who God is and what God wants from me. That I can read the Bible for myself and I can have a a relationship with God for myself and nature and the universe and everything that I see and that I feel and that breathes and has life is God. God is in the trees. God is in the streams. God is in here. God is wherever love is.
isn't it? That weight you carry, that hurt you carry, that quiet you carry. Dreams deferred, all shriveled up and buried so deep that you, you, you almost forget they were ever born. Kind of like you. It's happy, sis. Shit, been with it so long, you greeted like an old friend that owe you what they promised, but left you without a promise to pay. So you claw, scratch, move, and dance. Only that rhythm you do. Anything to get you from up under the weight of this world, a world that don't see you, don't like you. I see you, sis. <laughs> Keep moving. Keep dancing. Grease those legs. Shimmy that sham and show us how it's done. I let the sun beat on me right. Bear skins and I'm brown like the plant me bike Brown dumb saw me like Give me, give me some or die I lick the gun or bus Put her on my tongue or lash You hate me when I take you Suddenly right in the summer dust I'm like a summer trust Money on my bummer Cause you know I'll be expensive When you open up your cover thoughts You know I mean this I'm the cleanest in my slumber Pipes is cleaner than a plumber Like that felt like it was lumber dust I burn up everything that's under us Every village for the thunder of What is a blunder when I ponder What they've done for us Why can't they drive cancerous Like we was cancerous Doing little dances standing next to us A lack of trust You thought I wasn't gonna give my life You thought I wasn't gonna take this chance To live my life I Whoa. didn't even buy that shit when I was just a baby girl Both hands always on my hips And plotting how I changed the world Angry at the violence on the TV Let it settle in so when they start to kill off all my people I'm so sensitive, I let it rip Focus on my energy, a veteran The universe, a mailbox Every day I put my letter in If I go against my conscience I could kiss my heart goodbye And there's so many people who don't have one And they wonder why Makes me cry Fills my house with tears And then I wonder why He wants to fill my Big wings on them I project so many things on them I think we'll survive it though, rough times I think we're still biting though They still think we're rhyming, bro, what timing, bro Taking over cities, we have yet to go We're shining, huh? Think I shouldn't say that You have to know And if I didn't pray, what would I have to show? Each day I ask to grow As long as all my family's safe, I have no need to lie As long as they have what they need, then I succeed in life 